name is Kayla Del Biondo, and I'm the Digital Services Librarian at New Canaan Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual program, Planting for the Bees Needs, Providing Habitat for a Diversity of Bees with Dr. Kimberly Stoner. Um, I just wanted to announce that tonight's program was a collaboration uh, between the New Canaan Pollinator Pathway, underwritten by the New Canaan Conservation Commission. And I will go ahead and turn it over to New Canaan Beautification Leaves, po Leagues Pollinator Pathway Representative, Betsy Samarco. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you and the library for hosting this presentation. Tonight's presentation is a joint effort, as Kayla said, of our New Canaan Pollinator Pathway, whose goal is to continue corridors of pollinator-friendly properties with private and public land in our town. New Canaan became part of the Pollinator Pathway Movement officially last year and was initiated with our community partners here in New Canaan, which include the Library, Grace Farms, the New Canaan Beautification League, New Canaan Garden Club, New Canaan Land Trust, the New Canaan Nature Center, the Glass House, Planet New Canaan, the New Canaan Department of Public Works, and the Norwalk River Watershed Association. To learn more about the Pollinator Pathway in New Canaan, you can go to the Pollinator Pathway website at pollinator-pathway.org and navigate to the list of pathways in Connecticut and then click on the New Canaan link. From there, you can find some of our local references and you can find out how you can officially join the Pollinator Pathway in our town. And from those, those of you who are visiting from outside New Canaan, if you click on the um, link to the pathways, you can see the variety of, um, there's three states that are listed there and the variety of towns that are listed that have pollinator pathways. And as Kayla said, this presentation was made possible with a donation from the New Canaan Conservation Commission. And for that, we are very thankful. So now I am happy to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kimberly Stoner, joined the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in 1987 after receiving her PhD in entomology from Cornell University and spending a year on a fellowship with the Africa Bureau of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Her PhD in early professional work at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station was in vegetable entomology. In her 30 years at CAES, she has moved from studying plant resistance to insects, to alternatives to insecticides for managing vegetable insects, to holistic case studies of organic farms, and to focusing on bees, including both wild bees and honeybees. She is currently studying bee diversity in Connecticut, pollination of pumpkins and squash, and how bees are exposed to pesticides. She also works with people across Connecticut, including farmers, beekeepers, and community groups in creating habitat for pollinators. It's a pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Stoner. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, thank very, you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am hearing an echo. Are you hearing an echo? I, no, I guess just at the beginning I was hearing an echo. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk, as they said, about planting for the bees needs and uh, talking about a diversity of bees. So I'll talk just a little bit about pollinators in general at the beginning and some about honeybees. And then most of the rest of the talk will be about a diversity of other bees and what you can do to help those bees. The first thing I'd like to do is a land acknowledgement. Um, just in the last year, I've realized that it is important at the beginning of my talks to acknowledge that I am on the traditional land of the Quinnipiac, Pagasset, and Wappinger peoples. I'm actually speaking to you from New Haven. Um, many of you will be joining me from the land of the Poconoc people. And as we talk about native plants and insects and other wildlife, it's important to acknowledge that native people have lived and still live in community with these creatures in this place for approximately 12,500 years. I, I realized how important this is um, when I was reading about an archeological dig on the Farmington River where 
they found artifacts from native people in Connecticut from 12,500 years ago. That is close to the time when the glaciers receded. So there have been people in Connecticut who have been managing um, the ecosystem in various ways for all of that time. And it's important to thank them for what they have done, for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and to follow their example. Okay, let's advance the slide here. So why do we need to protect pollinators? 87% um, of all plant species, it's been estimated, are pollinated by animals of some sort, mostly bees and flies, but also wasps and beetles and moths and ants and bats and birds. Um, crop pollination is critical to our fruit, food supply. So pretty much all the food that's really interesting, all the fruits and nuts and fruiting vegetables um, are pollinated uh, by insects. So things like uh, corn and wheat and rice are wind pollinated, um, but a lot of the other crops are pollinated by, um, typically by insects. And of course, insects are, are a, an important part of the food chain for other animals. So you can go to the next slide. And so, um, as I was saying, there's a whole range of pollinating insects. Um, in, uh, in addition to bees, there are hoverflies, which is what you see on the left. Um, entomologists call them serpid flies. Um, and they are mimics of bees, so a lot of people think that they are bees, but they are actually flies. There are a lot of other kinds of flies. Um, so these are insects that are beneficial in other ways as well. So hoverflies, their larvae are predators on aphids. Tachinid flies um, lay their eggs on uh, herbivorous insects like caterpillars and squash bugs, and they're, they're uh, they are what are called parasitoids. So their larvae hatch out and feed from the inside on those caterpillars and squash bugs and oftentimes kill them or keep them from reproducing. And then parasitic wasps, which is what you see on the right, um, are also parasitoids. So the wasp that you see is laying her egg in an aphid and her larvae then would eat the aphid from the inside out and kill it. So these beneficial insects that um, we consider to be beneficial because they are predators or parasitoids on insects that we would consider to be pests um, also need flowers. They feed as adults on nectar and pollen. And so, um, so they're also important in multiple ways. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, I know that people are going to be really serious about pollination when they start talking about flies. Flies are second most important in pollination after bees. Um, part of that is because flies have lots of hairs, as do bees, that can pick up pollen and carry pollen from one flower to another. Um, I'm not going to get into the life cycle of flies. Um, their life, their larvae, their life cycle and what their larvae feed on is very different from bees, but, um, but they are important pollinators. And this is a fly on uh, mountain mint, which is a great plant for a variety of pollinating insects. Next slide. Um, butterflies. Um, I just today was at a presentation about butterflies. Butterflies um, uh, are also pollinators and also need to feed particularly on nectar. Um, and, but uh, creating habitat for butterflies um, involves not just planting plants for the flowers, but also for um, the caterpillars to feed on. So you need, in, or in order to keep butterflies, you would need to know for example, that this 
fritillary that you see, uh, the larvae feed on violets. So you would need to have the larval host plant as well as the flowers for the butterflies to feed on. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to talk, because we're going to talk about bees, we're going to talk about the myths people have about bees and the fears that people have about bees and about being stung. So the next slide, please. So um, in general, for bees and wasps, the solitary bees and wasps generally do not sting unless they're forced to, essentially. If they're trapped in your clothing or you're an entomologist and you have them in your net. Um, some solitary bees don't even have any, neck, any venom. Um, there are solitary bees and wasps that nest in aggregation. So what it means to be a solitary bee or wasp is that each female creates her own nest. Um, so there's not a queen and a bunch of workers. That's what happens in social bees and wasps. So sometimes these solitary bees and wasps, each female is making her own nest, but they are together in the same place with lots of individual nests, but that does not make them more likely to sting. Only female bees and wasps sting. A stinger in the order Hymenoptera is a modified ovipositor. So only females have a stinger. And then social bees and wasps are more likely to sting because they have a big nest to defend and they have this structure where they have a queen and a lot of workers and the workers can be sacrificed to save the colony if they if if need be so it's the social creatures that are the stingers there's been a lot of publicity um, across the whole country including here in connecticut about um, what entomologists call the giant asian hornet what the people in the media sometimes call the murder hornet. We do not have this um, murder hornet or giant Asian hornet in Connecticut. Um, they have been found, a few of them have been found in the northwest corner of Washington state, about as far from Connecticut as you can get in the lower 48 states. But there's been so much hype that um, people are um, calling up the experiment station. We have an insect inquiry office, I should mention. And so people are calling up the insect inquiry office all the time saying, I have seen the murder hornet. Um, you have not seen the murder hornet. Uh, so what you most likely have seen here in Connecticut is uh, called the cicada killer wasp. These are solitary wasps. So as you just learned, they don't, they are not likely to sting. Um, only the females can sting also, uh, as is true of all of Hymenoptera. Um, so uh, they, they are of similar size to the giant hornet. Um, so they are big and they're scary looking. Uh, you can go to the next slide actually. Um, but they uh, are not likely to sting you. Um, a colleague of mine at the experiment station put up um, one of those decision tree um, uh, uh, papers where the question is, should I be afraid of cicada killer wasps? And the one branch in the decision tree was, are you a cicada? If the answer is yes, you should be very afraid of cicada killer wasps because the female will come and sting you and paralyze you and drag you down her, her burrow and her larvae will feed on you. Um, and so if you're a cicada, if you are not a cicada, you should not be afraid. A lot of people see cicada killer wasps flying around and those are mostly the males because the males defend territory. So the males are flying around sort of fighting with each other. They don't have any stingers, um, but they, you know, they're big, they look scary. 
uh, the females are busy going up in the trees and getting cicadas and taking them back to their burrows. So you're not even likely to see the females um, unless you're looking for them. Um, but people, you know, people are freaked out by seeing these big wasps. So I want to make clear that you have nothing to be afraid of. Next slide. However, the wasps that you are most likely to be stung by are the social wasps, as I said before. So those are yellow jackets. Um, and some of them we call hornets, um, but they are all actually in the same family of social wasps. Um, so uh, the, um, and each of these is pretty common. Um, mostly people get stung towards the end of the summer as the uh, nests of these social wasps get larger and larger and there are more uh, workers and um, they have more opportunity to defend the nests and there are more resources in the nests. So, um, you know, so this is, this is what is actually potentially a risk. And so it's good to know about the biology of these different social wasps. Next slide. The other social insects that are most likely to sting you are honeybees, but they are much less likely to sting you than these um, yellow jackets. Honeybees, as you probably know, are important pollinators of crop plants. Um, and in large part, that's because we um, manage honeybees and we can move them around. So we can move them to crops that are blooming for a short time or that are grown on great large acreages or both and um, can put them there during the time that the crop needs to be pollinated and then move them to another crop. Um, so, uh, so they are important and they are beneficial for us. Um, they are not native to North America. So uh, a popular saying amongst people who are interested in bees is saving the honeybees in order to save the environment is like saving chickens in order to save the environment. You know, chickens, we like chickens. We like to eat chickens. Um, chickens are important to us, but um, they're domestic animals. Um, they're livestock and honeybees are also livestock. Next slide, please. Beekeepers, um, as you have probably heard, have to work hard to keep honeybees in recent years. Um, so starting in 2006, there's been this survey to look at how many honeybee colonies are lost by beekeepers each year. And um, quite a large percentage are lost every year. Um, you can see that some years, the total annual loss has been as much as 45%. Um, and pretty much most years, it's 30%. So that's, that's a big loss. And um, uh, so, and, and it, happen, it, it happens every year. So people who keep bees, are stressed out. It involves a lot of work and it's um, in recent decades. Uh, next slide, please. But the, um, this is another part of the myths and fears. Um, I get as a person who's interested in the environment and also interested in bees, I get emails and Facebook posts all the time saying, Honeybees are going extinct and we're all going to die. And um, that's really not true. So this is an old graph. It only goes up to 2012, but the most recent information that I could get from the National Agricultural Statistics Service is at the bottom. So for a, lo a long time, going back um, to 2006 when colony collapse disorder happened, that's what CCD stands for. Um, the number of honeybee colonies in the United States has been fluctuating between about two and a half million colonies and close to three million colonies. Um, so there's not you know, the precipitous decline that a lot of people are afraid of. 
That seems to conflict with the previous slide that shows that beekeepers lose a lot of colonies each year. But what happens is that beekeepers have ways to replace their colonies. So they can split their existing colonies. Um, they can uh, get packages of bees along with queens from, queen, uh, from, um, from bee breeders. Um, and uh, so they're, even though they have to work really hard at maintaining the number of colonies that we have in the United States, they still um, are able to do it. And in large part, they are motivated to do it by economics because um, there's a, a good market for pollination services and so the large beekeepers in the United States um, are getting well paid to keep their honeybee colonies going and to provide pollination services to crops. Next slide, please. The biggest problem they have, beekeepers, whether they are large beekeepers or backyard beekeepers, are these mites. The, the biggest problem is these mites and the viruses that they carry. Um, so uh, these mites arrived in the US in the 1980s. Um, and over time, we found more and more viruses that these mites are transmitting and accelerating really in honeybee colonies. There's one in particular that's called the deformed wing virus that's very widespread and that people have studied. It existed before the varroa mites, but when the varroa mites came along, they really accelerated the, the change to a different strain that um, is multiplying much faster. So beekeepers have to be managing these mites, which is tricky because you're killing um, a mite, which is not very distant physiologically from bees and trying to kill them in a honeybee colony. So it's, it's a tricky thing for beekeepers to figure out how to do. Next slide. So honeybees are uh, different from all of the native bees. So um, as I said earlier, they're not native to this country. They were brought here pretty much as soon as Europeans got here. Um, in the 1620s. They evolved in Asia. They are pretty much native to Europe. They've been, lived in Europe for now, they think, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and they're just very strange um, in relation to other bees, in relation to other insects, really. So they live in these huge colonies with tens of thousands of workers. They do not go dormant in the winter. They overwinter as a cluster of workers and queen. And so, and the workers are continually moving around and they're essentially burning honey um, that, and, and in their metabolism in order to move around and to keep the temperature in the hive up, um, Part of the winter it's at 55 degrees and when the queen starts laying eggs in February it goes all the way up around 90 degrees. So that's one reason why honeybees have to store a lot of honey, um, particularly when you get to northern climates like Connecticut because they need to have enough honey to be able to burn through the entire winter until they're able to go out and forage for nectar again the following year. They um, reproduce by swarming. Um, so uh, the, the, a part of the colony sort of breaks off with the and thousands of workers and they will hang together in a swarm for a while while the workers go out and find a new place to move into. And then they'll move as a colony into that new place. Um, and so that's how we get more honeybees in nature. Um, and then uh, beekeepers sort of mimic that process in dividing up 
the hives in order to um, increase the number of, of domesticated um, colonies that they keep. And you may know too that they have this interesting behavior where um, they can communicate within the colony. So scout bees go out to find nectar and pollen sources and they go back and they do a waggle dance to communicate to the other workers um, and uh, recruit foragers to go out to the locations where there's food. So that is something that's been very deeply studied and it's a very interesting behavior, but it's also very different from other bees and other insects. Next slide. So, and there's a lot more to bees than just honeybees. So these are some examples of um, a bumblebee on the left, uh, one of the green sweat bees in the middle, and another sweat bee on the right. Uh, next slide. So, and uh, one of the ideas people have is that it's only honeybees that crop, that pollinate crop plants, and that's not really true either. So this is from a study done um, in Virginia by a graduate student. And so when you look at the pie charts for each of these crops, um, this is the, the proportion of the different bees that visit that, the flowers of that crop plant. And um, the light blue in each of the, um, the light blue slice of pie in each case, um, it is the amount that, uh, the proportion that's honeybees. Um, and you can see uh, that um, the bumblebees are prominent there, the dark blue slice of the pie, as we go further through the season. So early in the season where for apple pollination, there are only queen bumblebees. So there aren't that many of them and they're not that important. But as we go later on through the season, bumblebees are important. And then um, she, uh, she div only divided up the other bees into carpenter bees and medium and small bees. We'll talk some more about what might be included in some of those categories. But um, for the most part, the medium bees are gonna be uh, solitary bees of different kinds. And the small bees are gonna be sweat bees, some of which are social and some of which are solitary. Um, and these other bees are um, almost all native species of bees. Next slide, please. So in Connecticut, so far, we have 349 species of bees. Um, as um, Elizabeth mentioned in my introduction, I'm working on a checklist. I Actually, it's really my technician, Tracy Zarillo who is working on a checklist of bees of Connecticut. And so we're gonna have more than 349 when we get done. Um, nine species are um, exotic, so from somewhere else in the world, and the rest of them are native. As I said, the honeybee is exotic and a social insect. We historically had 16 species of bumblebees, um, all of which are native and social. I'll talk a little bit about um, bumblebees uh, as we go forward. We don't have all of the species that we used to have. Um, and then just a few examples of different groups of bees. So calides, um, which are solitary bees that tunnel in the ground and they line their, their tunnels with something that resembles cellophane. So we call them cellophane bees. Mason bees, 20 species. You may have heard of mason bees. That, um, those are the bees that people um, often make bee houses for. They are solitary bees. They make um, their nests in um, hollow stems or in tunnels in wood, in pre-existing tunnels. Um, and so people make those bee houses that have tunnels for them to nest in. Um, and so some of them can be managed because when people make those bee houses, you can move those houses full of bees from one place to another. Um, andrina, so those are digger bees. We have 84 species of andrina. 
Those are solitary bees. Um, as the name implies, they are ground nesting solitary bees, and I'll talk a little more about them. Um, and then we have over 91 species of sweat bees. Sweat bees are small bees, um, mostly solitary, but some of them are social. Um, some of them are bright green, as you saw in a previous slide. Most of them are um, dark colored. Um, and they're called sweat bees because some of them will land on your arm and drink a drop of sweat. Um, people think that they're trying to get the salts in your sweat. Um, and those are just a few examples. There are many other species, um, mostly solitary bees. Next slide, please. So um, andrenid bees, which are mostly in the genus Andrina. So as I mentioned, they're ground nesting, they're solitary. Many of them have even lost the ability to produce venom. So um, they're really unlikely to sting you. Um, there are a number of species that are specialists. So that means that these females um, when they uh, make their nest and they stock it with pollen, they will stock it with the pollen of only a certain genus of plants. Um, and um, so, for example, uh, willows, they'll, they'll use only the pollen of willows and feed their larvae on that. Um, so, and there are 84 species in Connecticut. Next slide. So uh, we previously saw a slide about um, bees on apples from Virginia. This is a different study from New York State. And you can see the big blue slice of the pie. Um, that is mining bees. So that's the genus Andrina. So in this study, looking at bee visitation on, and on apple flowers, um, over half. Um, well, I guess just about exactly half of the, the uh, visits were from the genus Andrina. And there were dozens of species in the genus Andrina that were visiting um, the apple flowers. Honeybees were a substantial fraction um, in this study in New York State. And then sweat bees, as we just talked about, these tiny little bees, um, bumblebees, um, other, uh, other bees in the family Apidae uh, that are related to honeybees and bumblebees, cellophane bees, and then mason bees. So, um, so people, as I said, people often think that it, we, the only bees that are doing crop pollination are honeybees, but you can see that there is a lot of diversity in, and that we need a lot of diversity for the pollination of apples. Next slide. So this shows the life cycle of a solitary bee. So I've, I've talked about some of this before. So um, uh, in the winter, uh, in the solitary bees uh, would be in whatever form they overwinter. A lot of them overwinter in a pupal or pre-pupal form, and they would be in whatever habitat the bee makes its nest. So for this example, from a ground nesting bee, the pupa would be in the ground, um, tunneled where the, in, in the tunnel that the female made, um, actually in a little cell off of that tunnel. And that's where um, this overwintering stage would spend most of its life. Um, it would emerge at a particular time of the year. Some of the solitary bees are spring emerging, some of them are fall emerging, um, but um, pretty much all of our solitary bees have only one generation a year. Typically the males emerge first and then the females emerge afterwards. Um, they mate. The females um, uh, feed on nectar for their energy and, and collect pollen, feed on pollen themselves and also collect pollen to feed their larvae. They make a nest. As I've referred to, they, the solitary bees can nest in different kinds of habitats. 
A lot of them are ground nesting. And so what a ground nesting female would do is she would make a tunnel in the ground. Some of them tunnel quite deep. Some of them tunnel three feet down into the ground. Um, way they can do that in Connecticut. Um, they make little cells off of the tunnel. Each cell like this would be stocked with a mixture of nectar and pollen. Then the female would lay an egg on that, on that provision and she would close off the cell. So there's no um, uh, care after, after stocking and laying the, and, and stocking the cell and then laying the egg, unlike honeybees, for example. The egg hatches out to be a larva. The larva feeds on the provision. Now people think that um, oftentimes the larva is feeding on the microbes that are, are developing on the, on the provision, the bacteria and the yeast that develop in this mixture of nectar and pollen. The larva develops to whatever stage is the overwintering stage, which might be, for example, a pupa. And then it spends the rest of the year until the time for emergence in, um, in that overwintering stage. So that's a year, an annual life cycle of a solitary bee. Next slide. So I've already mentioned that some of them are specialists feeding their larvae only certain kinds of pollen. This is a picture of a squash bee, um, which uh, is a, a species that feeds its larvae only pollen from the genus Cucurbita, uh, which, are, which is uh, the pumpkins and squash. Um, these bees, uh, people think, uh, evolved in the southwestern United States where pumpkins and squash are native plants and they spread to New England um, as native people moved pumpkins and squash here to New England. So, um, they, and so, and they are completely dependent on this crop uh, for their livelihood. Next slide, please. So do native bees need native plants? Um, so the social bees typically are generalists because they have um, a long life cycle. Um, they have to maintain colonies over a long season. Um, they may prefer native plants, but um, you know, depending on you know whether they're you know um, they're a whole range of different things that determine what their preferences are uh, within the range of, of uh, sources of nectar and pollen that are available to them. But they are typically pretty adaptable. Um, bees, um, as I just said, um, typically have one generation a year. They have a short season of activity. Typically the females are out for maybe six to eight weeks. Um, and they'll specialize on pollen of a native gen genus or a few genera, or they can be generalists on many different blooming plants during their season of activity. So um, in some cases, they are completely dependent, some of the solitary bees on particular native plants. In other cases, they can be more generalist and feed on a wider range of flowers. Next slide. And so here are some of the plant genera in New England that have specialist bee species. Um, so goldenrod, goldenrod is an amazing plant and it has 11 species of specialist bees. Goldenrod also is tremendous for a lot of generalist bees, including honeybees and bumblebees and a lot of other um, flower feeding insects as well. Um, the uh, American asters that are now in the genus Symphiotrypcum, they have seven species. Um, so you can see, looking at this whole list, there are a number of different herbaceous plants like goldenrod and asters, yellow loosestrife, sunflowers, and there, but there are also trees and shrubs. So this is another idea that people have is that 
pollinator habitat is only meadows with herbaceous plants. But um, actually trees and shrubs are very important and they're important, they're important for honeybees and bumblebees, some of the generalist bees, as well as being important for particular um, specialist bees. So there are eight species of bees in New England that specialize on willow, um, five that specialize on the genus vaccinium that includes blueberries and cranberries and a few other, other species. So, um, uh, so, you know, we can encourage both the specialists and a range of, net, of generalist bees by planting these native plants that also have specialist bees. Next slide. And now I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about bumblebees. So this is um, a bumblebee again on mountain mint. Next slide. And um, bumblebees, as we've seen, can be important pollinators. I actually just published a paper looking at pollination of pumpkins and squash. And um, as we saw, there are the specialist bees, um, the squash bees that are pollinators, but bumblebees are actually the bees that have do the most pollination of um, the three species, squash bees, bumblebees, the common Eastern bumblebee is really the one that does it, and honeybees on pumpkins and squash. So um, bumblebees do half or more of the pollination um, of pumpkins and squash. Then, and they are also important pollinators on a range of other crops, particularly crops that are flowering um, later on in the year, so not the earliest blooming flowering um, crop plants, but also they're important pollinators of a lot of the native plants as well. Next slide. And we've lost, we've lost some species of bumblebees. Um, you may have heard of the rusty patched bumblebee, which is Bombus affinis, which is the the first on the list of bumblebee species declining in the Northeast. So um, it is a federally listed endangered species. Um, and it's also um, a state listed species here in Connecticut as well. We have not seen Bombus affinis um, in the state and it's assumed to be extirpated in the state. It still exists in um, some uh, populations in the upper Midwest. And just recently, people have found some in the Appalachian Mountains in Virginia and West Virginia, but nobody has found any uh, rusty patched bumblebees in New England for at least 10 years. Um, so, um, and as you can see, the last time we saw one in Connecticut was 1997. These used to be quite common bees. Um, as we work on the checklist and we go through the records of um, bees that have been collected in Connecticut um, and studies people did um, where they were looking at pollinators on different flowers. The Bombus affinis used to be a very common bee, but it is gone. It's gone from Connecticut. Um, Bombus ashtoni um, is likely also gone from Connecticut. It's on the state list, but nobody has seen it since 1992. Um, the other state listed bee, Bombus tericola, people um, uh, thought that it was gone, but in recent years it has reappeared. So you can see we caught it last year. Actually, we have uh, seen a few of them this year as well. So um, it seems to be making a comeback, um, even though it's a state listed species. Uh, so um, you can see there's quite a long list of bumblebee species that are declining in the east. And we are um, out looking for a lot of these bees. I was just corresponding with Laura Saucier of the Connecticut Department of um, Energy and Environmental Protection, 
about uh, the possibility of doing some citizen science surveys to get people out looking for some of these declining bumblebees. There are some that are increasing or that are stable over here on the right. Bombus impatiens in particular is, um, that's the bee that I saw uh, pollinating pumpkins and squash and is quite an abundant bee um, and seems to be expanding in range. So we are not losing all our bumblebees and Early, but we're losing the diversity. We're losing some of our species. Next slide, please. So this is what the life cycle of bumblebees looks like. So um, uh, we'll start with the winter. So um, unlike honeybees, um, in the winter, uh, it, the only Bumblebees that are alive are the mated queens and they are dormant. Um, they find some little uh, hole to hole up in. This is actually something we don't know enough about is exactly where bumble, queen bumblebees are overwintering. But they find a place to hole up over the winter um, and they go dormant. Um, and then uh, the queens come out, those mated queens out in the spring and then the queen um, so they have an annual life cycle uh, so they have colonies but it's on an annual cycle the queen has to go out herself and do foraging for herself collect nectar and pollen for herself she has to find a place to establish a nest um, a lot of times bumblebees nest in abandoned holes of other animals like chipmunks um, or uh, mice. Um, and she secretes wax to cover the nest and make it waterproof. She um, uh, essentially creates the whole nest. She uh, goes out, she uh, stocks it with nectar and pollen, lays eggs, goes out and forages for nectar and pollen to feed the larvae. Um, she incubates the larvae. So that's what the bee is doing in this um, part of the diagram. She's applying her abdomen to the larvae and heating up her abdomen um, in order to make the larvae develop faster. And um, so she's doing everything herself. She's a single mom for a while. And then once the workers uh, the first cohort of workers um, develops to adulthood. Then the workers take over foraging, maintaining the nest, all that kind of thing. And the queen becomes more like a queen honeybee and her job is mainly to lay eggs. Um, and then um, the colony grows, continues to produce workers for a period of time. At the end of the colony cycle, um, the colony produces males and then produces queens, new queens. Um, the males and the new queens mate. The queens, um, again, need to stock up um, and feed themselves lots of pollen and nectar so that they can make it through the winter. Um, and then uh, everybody else dies and only the mated queens go through the winter. So that's the bumblebee life cycle. Next slide. So um, planting for bumblebees. What is it that we need to do to plant for um, bumblebees and other wild pollinators? So this is actually a study, and even though the title says wild, wild pollinators, it was really a study about bumblebees. It was a very clever study that was done in England, but a lot of it is um, relevant here in the US. Um, next slide. So what do bumblebees need? So you can tell from their life cycle that there are certain times of year when they, that are most critical to the survival from one year to the next of bumblebee populations. So one of them is early in the season when the queens are um, out foraging and they're establishing the nest and they're incubating the larvae and they have to consume a lot of nectar to metabolize in order to keep the heat up on those larvae. 
And they're also late in the season when the new queens are bulking up for the winter. So in both of those times, they need nectar. Um, they also need pollen, actually, in both of those times. And, but then pollen is uh, the amount of pollen and the nutritional quality of the pollen uh, determines how well the colony over the course of this, the season, the growing season, is going to be able to um, produce new larvae because that's the source of protein that the larvae need to grow and to produce new queens and males. They need the nesting habitat, as I mentioned, often in abandoned nests of other species, birds and chipmunks and mice. They need overwintering habitat and they need protection from pesticides. Next slide. So these are some of the early season plants for queen bumblebees that my colleague um, Ann Averill found. And again, we're looking mostly at trees and shrubs. So uh, things like rhododendrons, willows, as I mentioned before, dogwood, holly, cherry, winterberry, willows. Um, uh, so it's not until you get towards the bottom of the list and get to like penstemon um, uh, that you start to see any herbaceous plants. So again, trees and shrubs are really important. Next slide. It's also important to protect um, all the bees, bumblebees and honeybees and native bees from pesticides. So um, uh, the first step is to minimize pesticide use, to use alternative methods wherever possible. Um, and when you need to use a pesticide, use the least amount needed at the time and location where it will be the most effective. So um, we call that in the entomological world, integrated pest management. So figuring out um, how to minimize the amount of pesticide and the toxicity of pesticide that, that we use. Um, avoid applying any kind of insecticides, toxic to bees, to plants in bloom. So uh, what people do in orchards, for example, um, is they wait until um, pollination is over before they apply pesticides. Um, and uh, they remove things like clover and dandelions or other kinds of flowering plants in the area before they spray. Um, you need to identify honey beehives in the area and work with the beekeepers. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about systemic insecticides. I've done a lot of research looking at insect in, in the systemic insecticides. Um, these you can't use as homeowners. They are restricted use pesticides in Connecticut because of their toxicity to bees and the risk of non-target effects, but they are still used by farmers. Next slide, please. And particularly, they're used as seed treatments. So um, this, these, this, these slides are from, these graphs are from a publication looking at the extent to which um, the neonicotinoids, which are systemic, which means they travel through the plant um, and get into pollen and nectar, but they also can travel, um, they can leach out of the, in the, the, into the soil and spread into um, other plants and into water. So there are more acres in the U.S. treated with neonicotinoids than for any other insecticide in history. And that's because there's so much acreage in which the seeds of things like corn and soybeans, as you can see up here, and cotton, um, are treated with these systemic insecticides. Um, oftentimes, uh, people will follow a crop like corn, like wheat, and all of these with these systemic insecticides. And a lot of studies have looked at whether there's any economic benefit um, in using these insecticides. And, um, and in many cases, there's not. Um, so they've become sort of default treatments 
And so we're not using integrated pest management, um, really. Um, they have negative effects on the insect natural enemies. And, um, and we're finding more uh, resistance developing to these systemic insecticides in the pests. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, these uh, systemic insecticides, part of what makes them able to travel through the plant is that they're water soluble. And so um, when they're applied to the seed, 5% um, of it goes into the crop, 1% of it goes off as dust, which is really toxic dust. Um, and people have looked at how that affects bees because they're little particles like pollen. But they also stay in the soil um, and they can leach out into waterways and they can um, travel in the soil to the plants on the margins of the fields. So there are multiple ways that the bees can be exposed. Next slide, please. And um, a colleague of mine, Susan Chan, has been looking at the so how the pesticides in the soil from these seed treatments can affect soil nesting bees. She actually looked at squash bees. Um, and as I've mentioned a number of times, most species of bees nest in the ground. So um, they could be in the soil with these systemic pesticides. It's something that we have not done nearly enough research on. Next slide. So what is pollinator habitat? So ideally, native trees and shrubs, native herbaceous perennials, because you need both of those things to have good sources of pollen and nectar uh, through the whole growing season and with diversity so that it, um, there are different kinds of flowers, different shapes of flowers for different kinds of pollinators. The larval host plants for moth and butterfly caterpillars minimizing the use of insecticides and fungicides, and also minimal use of herbicides. You may need them to manage invasive plants or other kinds of undesirable plants, but you need to minimize them. Providing the nesting habitat, um, so patches of bare ground, uh, leaving some other kinds of uh, native habitat. But in practical terms, really um, any kind of diverse, flowering plants with little or no pesticide use has some benefit for pollinators. And anything is better than a lawn, particularly a um, monochromatic lawn with no clover or no dandelions, except of course, pavement. Next slide, please. So um, I've looked at uh, pollinator habitat on farms and it's not necessarily native plants. So the one here on the left is a mixture of goldenrod and anise hyssop. So those are native plants. But um, this is a, a, a dairy farm where they also keep bees and they have a huge field of yellow sweet clover, which is not a native plant, but is a great source of nectar and also a good source of pollen for a lot of bees. Up here, this is an organic farm where they're growing squash and they're growing buckwheat in between uh, the rows of squash. And buckwheat um, is attractive to bees and also it's attractive to serpent flies and a lot of other fly pollinators. Next slide. So um, the Xerxes Society, um, is an organization that conserves invertebrates. So um, you might be familiar with the Audubon Society, for example, which um, originally, anyway, focused on birds. So the Xerxes Society focuses on invertebrates, including uh, pollinating insects, but also lots of other kinds of invertebrates like fireflies and freshwater mussels and all kinds of invertebrates. They have a lot of information about pollinators. I'll give you, if, when I get to the end, uh, a link to their website. Um, uh, but they have guidelines for farmers about if you're going to grow pollinator habitat near your crops that you treat with pesticides, how much space do you need to leave in order to protect 
the pollinators from the pesticides. And mostly what I want to say about this is that um, it becomes tricky for farms that are using pesticides to also have pollinator habitat. So that's part of the reason I think why we need to have refuges for pollinators um, in all kinds of other places so that we have uh, vibrant communities of pollinators um, that are able to pollinate our crops, but that are not dependent on farms for their pollinator habitat. Next slide. So, and possible refuges for bees are home gardens. Um, and this is my own garden. Um, these were taken uh, about June. My own garden is looking much more overgrown now. But, um, you know, uh, substituting a lot of diversity of trees and shrubs and flowering plants for a lawn. Um, provides lots of refuges for bees and also for a lot of other insects and wildlife. Next slide, please. This is a great book that's um, available on the Pollinator Pathway website. All of the, the whole book is on the Pollinator Pathway website. And I kind of wish that I had it before I planted all those native plants because it's about design about how to grow native plants in your yard and have it, you know, look um, like a garden um, and um, look good. So um, I'm recommending that. Next slide. I'm also, this is a campaign I've been on for a while. Leaves are not litter. Um, so the Xerxes Society is very big on leaving the leaves. So if you're not growing a lawn, then you don't have to worry about leaves that will, you know, suppress the lawn. Um, and the leaves become good mulch for all your native plants. And leaves are, you know, that's part of our native ecosystem and it provides habitat for overwintering insects, including um, bees. Um, and also lots of other things, fireflies and moths and beetles. Um, other kinds of bee habitat, some uh, bumblebees nest in grass tussocks, um, some kinds of native bees, other bees uh, nest in brush piles, in the pithy stems of perennials. So leaving a lot of natural materials helps to provide habitat for pollinators. Next slide. And um, then uh, you can substitute native plants for the invasive ornamental plant species. So this is from uh, my own experiment station, and it's a publication that um, gives alternatives. So when you uh, remove your, um, your na uh, invasive plants, uh, you can substitute like your burning bush, for example, or um, uh, multiflora rose, you can substitute these um, alternative native plants. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to say quickly about um, the habitat in uh, that um, used to exist under high voltage transmission lines. So there was a lot of research done here in Connecticut in the 1950s about how to maintain these, um, these power line corridors so that um, they didn't have to be doused completely with herbicides. And they found that using very selective targeted use of herbicides just to take out the tall trees, you could get a shrub layer that would suppress the new tree saplings so the trees wouldn't get up into the power lines and would maintain an herbaceous layer um, directly in the wire zone. And this was great habitat uh, for uh, bees and a lot of other wildlife, including the New England cottontail, including a lot of Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, and including a lot of important native plants as well. Next slide. 
And so this is from a, a paper that was recently written about um, the power line habitats. And you can see that there are, there's a paved area, you know, for access for the power company, but there's a lot of native shrubs. You can also see lots of goldenrod um, and, and it's just tremendous habitat. And we don't have a lot of open habitat here in Connecticut because typically if we leave things alone, it grows up into forest. So this is important to a lot of species that need open uh, shrub and herbaceous habitat. Next slide. But this is what's happening now in Connecticut is um, Eversource in particular is going through and essentially paving all of this, uh, all of the utility rights of way and um, destroying this native habitat. And so I had a whole workshop uh, last spring for land trusts uh, around the state and for other people who are concerned about this. So if you're interested in this, get in touch with me and I will send you information about uh, what's going on with uh, preserving the bi biological value of our rights of way. Next slide, please. Okay, and so um, this is the link. Actually, I put all the materials from the workshop up on this website. Um, and so you can find the materials from that workshop and also from previous workshops that the Connecticut Land Conservation Council did. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to quickly move through this. You can just advance it through all the animation um, because uh, Elizabeth has already talked to you about the pollinator pathway. So this is a, a great network of local communities. As she was talking about, there are all kinds of people in New Canaan who are working on the pollinator pathway in your own town. And this is happening in something like 105 towns. Um, about 65 or so of them are in Connecticut. There are also a lot in Eastern New York State and in um, Northeastern Pennsylvania. And so, you know, these are people who are getting together to plant native plants and um, choosing them particularly for their benefit for pollinators and um, keeping them free of pesticides. Next slide. And um, there's lots of, as I said, lots of towns. This is actually a pretty old slide now. Um, it keeps expanding very rapidly. Next slide. And I also want to plug the Xerxes Society, as I mentioned, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They have a wealth of information about all different kinds of habitats. So roadsides and schools and gardens. Um, so uh, this is another great source of information. Next slide. And um, my own website on the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, um, if you go to uh, www.ct.gov slash CAES, which stands for Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, you can either go directly to the pollinators um, website, or you can put pollinator in the search box and it takes you to the pollinator information page where I have um, lots of fact sheets, um, all my technical papers, um, uh, all the talks or almost all the talks, all the talks I was allowed to put up from the workshops, the pollinator habitat workshops that I've done for four years now, just all kinds of information about pollinators and pollinator habitat. Next slide. So uh, just to review quickly, what you can do to help bees, reduce or eliminate the use of insecticides and fungicides, restrict the use of herbicides to carefully targeted applications, um, particularly to invasive plants, plant flowering trees, shrubs, and perennials to provide nectar and pollen through the growing season, um, with native plants being the best, Eliminate your lawn, 
leave natural areas for nesting and overwintering habitat. If you're a beekeeper, you probably already know that you need to manage mites to prevent honeybee diseases and work with your community to preserve and create pollinator hab habitats. Next. And that's it. Um, so there is my contact information and my website. And I have gone some over time, but I'm happy to answer people's questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Stoner. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Bates Mason with Plant New Canaan. If anyone has any questions, you can just put it in the Q&A, type it in and we can read it out. Uh, the first question for you, Dr. Stoner is, is there any way for children and bees to get along on clover lawns? Are bumblebees known for stinging? So, um, Bumblebees are not uh, particularly likely to sting, um, especially when they're out foraging. Um, they are more likely to sting if you are um, in some way uh, um, potentially threatening their nest if you're um, uh, right next to their nest or you know trying to remove their nest or something. But um, so, uh, bumblebees can sting. Um, they are not very likely to sting. Um, clover, uh, clover is really good for honeybees as well as for bumblebees. Um, and um, mostly our clovers are not native plants, but they uh, do have a lot of high protein pollen, which is good for a lot of bees. So uh, mostly um, wear shoes so that you don't actually step barefoot onto bees that are out there foraging and you're not likely to get stung. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. The next one is what do fungicides do to bees? So um, this is a really active area of research. So um, fungicides um, uh, can sometimes interact with insecticides and make them more toxic by interfering with um, enzymes um, uh, that the bees have to break down, um, insecticides and other toxins. Um, fungicides also can um, directly interfere in some cases with the development of bee larvae. Uh, there's also a lot of research now looking at the microbiome of bees. So bees have um, yeasts and fungi, for example, in honeybee colonies, there are yeasts and fungi that live in the colony with the bees and that um, have a role in fermenting the pollen to make it into bee bread, which is actually what the uh, nurse bees eat in the honeybee colony. So, um, uh, so there's now research looking into whether, how, whether and how fungicides might be affecting the beneficial fungi and yeasts that uh, live with our bees. Great, thank you. The next is, uh, what do you think about uh, cedar oil spray for tick su suppression? Does it have an effect on bees and pollinators as well? So um, cedar oil, um, as far as I know, would only have an effect when it actually makes contact with the bees. So you probably don't want to be spraying it on flowering plants when bees are present. Um, uh, so uh, that's true of, of a number of different things that are just um, contact materials that you can spray them at other times when um, the, bees, the bees are not present or just avoid spraying it directly on flowers. Okay, and another last question we have so far is what is a substitute for lawn play areas for children playing ball? I guess. Yeah, so, um, uh, so you can have a mixture of clothes um, grass. Um, that's actually what lawns used to look like before we had herbicides that were that would selectively take out broadleaf plants and just leave the grasses behind. 
Um, and so, you know, so a mixture of white clover and grass is, um, is, uh, makes a surface that it, you know, takes a fair amount of trampling um, quite well and can be a playing surface. Okay, and what are the best native plants for late uh, season for bees and pollinators? So, um, goldenrod is great. Um, the New England aster is great and goes for quite a long time into the fall. Um, there are a lot of different fall asters, um, and I'm not going to know them all because I'm not that great a botanist. Um, uh, but um, I, those are uh, those are the main ones that come to mind. And then the last question I have is. Uh, goes to the springtime. What should we be planting for early uh, poll uh, for pollinators early in the season? So um, mostly what pollinators are using early in the season are trees and shrubs. So those are what mostly bloom early. Um, so things like willows are the first things out there. Um, uh, uh, I actually have a diagram um, that's on my website with a whole succession of different things. Um, uh, willows are uh, uh, things like dogwood. Um, there are also some bees that are specialists on some of the sp spring ephemerals, so the, the herbaceous uh, small plants that just bloom for a short time in the spring, like Claytonia. Um, and, um, gosh, for some reason, my brain is freezing. I'm not coming up with lots of, but like maples actually, um, uh, people think of them as being wind pollinated. They produce a lot of pollen that blows around in the wind, but they also have nectar and they also have pollen that feed, for example, the cellophane bees are, um, big feeders on maple pollen. Okay, great. And I think that was the last of the questions. So um, thank you very much. I don't know if Kayla, if you want to jump back on real quick. Yeah, Dr. Soner, that was awesome. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended.